Namaskar. Good evening. On behalf of the Institute Lecture Committee, Lecture Series Committee, and uh, the National Resource Center for Value Education and Engineering, I, M. R. Ravi, invite or welcome all of you to this gathering, uh, which is actually for the second uh, Professor R. R. Gore Memorial Lecture Oration on Science, Technology, and Human Values. So it's my um, honor and duty to uh, say a few words about the RRG Memorial Orations and about Professor Gaur, R.R. Gaur himself. So um, the RRG Memorial Oration actually was um, initiated through uh, uh, generous donations from uh, one of his closest friends and allies, Professor P.L. Dhar, and some other colleagues, faculty members in the institution. And uh, the first in the series of uh, the orations happened in February of 2023, when Mr. Varun Vidyarthi had uh, given a talk here in the, on this stage. The second in the series uh, is going to happen today with uh, uh, Professor Rajiv Sangal, who has actually worked also pretty closely with uh, Professor Gaur on uh, value education. And uh, today is uh, his talk. I mean, the topic of the talk would be artificial intelligence, human consciousness, and human society. Uh, to say a few words of Professor Gaur, he uh, was a professor of mechanical engineering, and uh, he was a passionate worker on rural technologies, and he was also the founding member of the National Resource Center for Value Education and Engineering in IIT Delhi. Um, his work in mechanical engineering actually uh, was on internal combustion engines, and uh, he led um, a few mission projects in the late 90s on um, introducing electronic controls in uh, automobile, engineer, automobile engines. He worked closely with many industries, both two-wheeler, four-wheeler, and uh, agricultural machinery, tractor engines. And subsequently, um, he and Professor Dhar together were uh, part of a project from Khadi Village Industries Commission for setting up the national um, uh, Mahatma Gandhi Institute of R Institute for Rural Industrialization. It used to be called NIRI at that time, National Institute for Rural Industrialization. When it was inaugurated, it was named after Mah Mah Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Rural Industrialization in Vardha. And in the process of setting it up, actually, um, they had um, visualized how the network of uh, technology flow should happen from higher academic institutions to the village. The other project which uh, Professor Dhar and Professor Gaur partnered and show, worked shoulder to shoulder together is the National Resource Center for Value Education and Engineering. Again, it was visualized as a national resource for introducing uh, human values in uh, institutions of science and technology. So uh, the National Resource Center for Value Education and Engineering, which is co-hosting this program, was founded in the year 2001 with the active involvement of the Ministry of uh, Human Resource Development then, now presently Ministry of Education. And Professor Dhar was its founding head and then Professor Gaur was the head of the center from 2005 to 2008. He uh, took voluntary retirement in the year 2009, uh, primarily to do the things that he loved to do most, which is primarily rural, rural technology and the value education. So he chaired the Rural Technology Action Group uh, at IIT Delhi as an honorary chairperson after his retirement and uh, steered the program to uh, a much better uh, state than where he found it when he joined it. And similarly, um, he also worked uh, shoulder to shoulder again with uh, uh, Professor Rajiv Sangal in introducing uh, value education in uh, technical institutions across the country and uh, together they had actually developed the curriculum textbook and uh, teaching teachers material workshops and so on. 
Uh, so uh, this is another activity which he was focused on. So after his retirement, until he passed away in 2020, he was quite um, actively engaged in both of these activities. COVID took him away from us on the 6th of December 2020. But um, although he has left his physical body, he has actually left his um, mark on the institute in the form of NRCV and on his family and various other uh, friends that have gathered here uh, with uh, you know the kind of uh, thinking that uh, he had about one's own spiritual development. So with this uh, basic uh, introduction, I would now like to invite uh, members of Professor Gaur's family to uh, share their uh, thoughts about Professor Gaur. Initially, first I would invite uh, Vishnu Priya, his granddaughter, on stage to speak to you about uh, her grandfather and subsequent. Namaskar. Very good evening to all of you who are present here. So, whenever my grandfather used to introduce our family, um, he used to say that we are total of five grandchildren. So, he used to say, Mere Paach Pandav. And I'm the eldest Pandav. <laughs> so, um, like you just mentioned, IIT has been his home away from home always. Even when he was here, it was his home. When we shifted to another home, IIT was still his home. All day long, it was just about how he spent time in IIT with Dr. Dhar, Professor Dhar here, and all his dearest colleagues. Physically, even if he was not in IIT, it was all about his office, his students, his subject, and human values. Now, the last time I was here for the first edition of this talk, I was extremely emotional because we had just lost him and everybody here was very emotional. But today, as I stand here for the second edition of this talk, I think I'm filled with gratitude for IIT, what this institution has added on to us as a family, and all of you here today, and my Baba, whose contributions made are such a valuable member of this institution. Now coming to the talk and theme which is here today, which is artificial intelligence, human consciousness and human society. Being an enthusiastic proponent and the leader in the field of human values, I'm pretty sure Baba's focus would have inevitably on human values, human consciousness, and integrating that into the human society. From what I have learned from him is that human values are the foundation of whatever we do. Be it your personal lives, be it your relations with others as you build them, be it your careers or any other field. And as they have so much result on who we are as we stand out, they have to be the essence of a person or an individual. For Baba, all the information about things which we have today and we call that as knowledge comes after the real knowledge of human values once they are inculcated in us. In his own words, if you are not happy in life, then all the knowledge which you possess is of no use. According to him, all the education that is being imparted today should be targeted to follow the four aspects. Learning to know, learning to do, learning to be, and learning to live together. For him, if this is not the goal of education which is imparted today, it is literally of no use. Taking forward from this, he elaborated on the two components of skills and values and the distinction and the correlation between the two. Values is the domain where one understands what is the right thing for us to do. Skills is the domain of how exactly we achieve what we want to do. The present education curriculum today unfortunately focuses or is dominant towards skills. But right now, here today, we'll understand how to 
add human values to the skills that we possess. Now you might think that human values is something very common or mundane. As humans, we must have human values. But that is not true. As, you know, we oil the parts of machines so that they work together nicely and don't get rusty, we need to put in conscious efforts and make our human values work so that when it actually comes, when we have to display them in our daily interactions, they're not rusty. The overarching meaning, or in his words, the SAR, is that human values cannot be compromised at any cost. By the virtue of being humans, they are non-negotiable. And the focus should be on that. I hope I was able to share a glimpse of what I learned from him that he had to share. And thank you so much for having us, our family, and you all. You're, you're a major part of our family. And um, thank you for organizing this every year. It just makes us so happy and grateful to all that we have to learn from you all. Professor, Professor Gaur's uh, younger son, Mr. Prabod Gaur, to share his thoughts. Respected audience, of the second Professor R. R. God Memorial Oration. On behalf of late Professor God family, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude towards Professor Rajiv Sangalji and the entire organizing team associated with NRCV. Professor God devoted a valuable time of his life working in the field of value education and for integration of human values with science and technology. I remember that various challenges were faced and finally with the support of Mr. Kao, then Secretary MHRD and the blessings of our former President Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, National Resource Center for Value Education in Engineering was established at IIT Delhi. Professor Gaur wanted value education to be a part of formal education system and introduced a book named Foundation Course in Human Values and Professional Ethics for the same. The central theme of this course in human values was how to live a fulfilling life. The whole process is through self-exploration, that is dialogue within. They will put up a proposal for you and the answer should come from within. The object is to develop right understanding. In my understanding of his teachings, basic aspirations of human being, that is happiness, prosperity, and its continuity are fulfilled by right understanding, relationship, and physical facility in the priority order. This was the core of his teachings which I could understand, that the priority is very important. Right understanding was put in the first priority. Most of the time, the physical facilities are put in the first priorities. What we are doing, what we are learning, what we are gaining, our first priority is to acquire most physical facilities. Then we look at the relation. Chalo, theek hai, thoda baut, father se, bhai se, brother se, relation bhi develop kar leti. Or third stage ki chalo right understanding bhi thodi baat aajayegi to achcha hai. But since we have physical facilities, we are the happiest person in the world. That is not true. That is not true. And this philosophy, this thought of right understanding was developed through value education in which they put the right understanding in the first priority, relations in the second priority and the physical facilities in the third priority. These three aspects are important to acquire our basic human goal that is happiness and prosperity in continuity. So he used to ask these questions to us. Do you want happiness now or you want it in the continuity? You want to remain happiness always? We used to say yes, we want to remain happy always. So it is not the physical facility which can make you happy always. Eat good food, wear good clothes, drive in a good vehicle. Will it keep you happy always? No. Unless until you have the right understanding you will not be a happy person always and you will not achieve 
the basic human goal. So these, though finally he termed his course as a happiness class. He changed that, uh, the heading of that class, the value education which they were teaching in the IIT, in, the, in our uh, family, it was called a happiness class because finally it was to achieve a happiness in our life. So I wish that all of us develop right understanding and live a fulfilling life full of happiness through value education. This course was therefore also called happiness class. I thanks to NRCV for giving us an opportunity to share our thoughts here and remembering Professor God. Thanks and regards from the entire family. Thank you. I request Professor P. L. Dhar to present a bouquet to Mrs. God uh, as mark of our love for them. Now I would like to invite the speaker, uh, Professor Rajiv Sangal, to the stage. And I would also like to request Professor T. R. Sri Krishnan, our Deputy Director of Operations, to present him with a book. So Professor Rajiv Sangal, uh, he, his basic uh, education started with a B.Tech degree from IIT Kanpur and a Master's and PhD from the University of Pennsylvania in 1980. Um, he served in the Department of uh, Computer Science and Engineering in IIT Kanpur uh, in the year 1982 to 1999, uh, out of which three years between 1987 and 1990, he headed the Department of Computer Science and Engineering. Uh, subsequently, he uh, was part of the IIIT Hyderabad, starting from um, 2002 uh, all the way until uh, 2013. And from the year 2013 to 2018, uh, he uh, was the director of the IIT BHU, Varanasi. And then subsequently, he returned to uh, uh, IIT Hyderabad, where he is an emeritus professor at this point in time. He has, um, he is, uh, his scientific interests are in the area of natural language processing, machine translation, and artificial intelligence. But, um, in addition to that, his contributions to the domain of human values, universal human values, is uh, immense and substantial. And uh, the, along with Professor Gore, he had, had developed the curricula, the, the textbook and the teacher's manuals and various things um, that were required for implementing uh, the education in human values as a package in um, uh, technical institutions. Uh, he is also the architect of the student induction program of um, AICT and as the chairperson of the National Coordination Committee of the Student Induction Program of AICT, he oversaw the implementation of the program uh, in the technical institutions across the country. With this uh, brief introduction, I would like to invite uh, Professor Rajiv Sangal to deliver his uh, talk today on the topic of artificial intelligence, human consciousness, and human society. Professor Sankar. I, of course, uh, want to thank you for inviting me. This is an honor. And I thought I'll share my thoughts on artificial intelligence and human consciousness. It's indeed an emotional moment. I have got introduced to Professor Gore the first time, this was in 2004. That was the time Professor Gore and Professor Dhar were already teaching courses on science and humanities, technology and humanities for, for a long time, 20 years or 15 years or more. And I was keen that something should be done in IIIT Hyderabad, of which I was the director. And in that process of exploration, I came in touch with Professor Gaur and Professor Bagadia, Ganesh Bagadia. And let me, you know, what I have mentioned here. Uh, so we started working together in developing a course which can be taught in formal education which goes through dialogue and discussion, not through do's and don'ts or preachings. Because any dis anything that is taught in education should be where students can question, 
and if they have doubts if they don't agree they should be able to say what doubts they have and we should be able to engage in a dialogue and a book came out of uh, that effort with major work i must say by professor gaur although i am a co-author but my contribution was small my contribution was more in experimenting with the course and how that course could be designed and at some point in time so this book came out in 2009 so around 2008 uh, there was a big request coming from several universities where they wanted to implement this course and it actually started with uptu at that time today it's called the abdul kalam uh, up technical university abdul kalam technical university umbrella organization for you know some 500 colleges at that time 500 engineering colleges and then it moved to ptu where ptu also adopted this course and this there was this massive program for training teachers so that it could be taught in a dialogue fashion not through lectures but through discussion so this is and you know those were the years we worked closely together we traveled to various parts of punjab and up had workshops conducted for faculty for heads of institutions and so on and this is what i have mentioned and i should mention that there was one event that gave a big impetus to this effort and that was the first convention on human values that was held in iit delhi right uh, in this seminar hall of course the inaugural <laughs> lecture was given by dr abdul kalam so we moved to the big auditorium but rest of the proceedings were right here and we had lot of and there were people from various colleges uh teachers heads of institutions from iits from non iits also and we had a and uh, you know professor dhar's presence was actually always there and he had you know that calm presence which affects the which brings everybody together so after this i should also mention professor god as an as a person it's a very simple soul is a loving soul and when we were doing these programs he, he would find something interesting and laugh and he had the laugh of a child you know child of a, a laugh of a person who is free of uh, any uh, negative feelings it was very straight forward and uh, his departure was so sudden we were all you know very shocked and uh, but anyway it's good to have this oration where we remember him and thanks to professor dhar for you know initiating setting it up and so on let me now come to the topic about uh, of my talk so i'll talk about artificial intelligence and the three laws of robotics i'll mention a few dilemmas and i'll talk about what is the law of uh, consciousness human consciousness just like like we can imagine the laws of robotics what are the laws of human consciousness what is the innate property of matter jad as we call it and the innate property of consciousness chetana and what does what implications if you have an understanding of the conscious about the human being then we can build a society which is aligned with it so if we understand chemistry how atoms come together we can start to build 
larger molecules. But if we do not understand the property of the atoms and we start building a larger molecule which does not quite fit in with the basic nature of the atoms, it is going to fall apart, it cannot last. So human society is like that. So that is what I thought I will try to talk about today. Regarding artificial intelligence, its uh, implications, it is a very large area, I was in a dilemma myself as to what I should cover. So when Sangeeta ji, Professor Sangeeta Kohli contacted me, so I said I can talk about this, uh, but I should be a little brief, I said, so that we can have discussion on larger issues also, anything other than that. And, and we can see how it goes, we can play it by the ear. So let me introduce to you the three laws of robotics. Now these are fictional laws, these are, these are formulated in 1942 by a science fiction writer Isaac Asimov. He was also a scientist himself. But he is well known for his uh, works on science fiction. So he formulated three laws. First law is a robot will not harm a human being nor allow harm to come to a human being through inaction. Okay? So robot will not harm a human being, it will not perform any action that will cause harm to a human being. And if through inaction some harm is coming to a human being, it will not remain spectator. It will go and do something to save the human being. The second law, robo will obey human being. Okay? And the last law, a robot will protect its existence. Now these three laws can come into conflict. What happens if a human being orders a robot to harm another human being? Right? Law number two, robot will obey human being and the human being orders the robot go and harm this other person. Right? Military use of robotics. So then there is also a built-in hierarchy, priority in these laws. So the first priority is L1 is greater than L2, which means if law L2 is being invoked and it comes into conflict with law L1, then it will not follow L2. Okay? So robot, even if it is ordered to harm a human being, it will not, because why? L2 is of lower priority. And L2 is greater than L3, which means robot will save itself. So if there is fire, robot will, you know, not jump into fire. But if a human being has ordered that go and save somebody in the fire, or he has ordered it that go and do this, and it may cause damage to the robot, namely L3. So L3 has lower priority than L2 and it of course follows that L1, L3 is also lower priority than L1. Okay? If a human being has to be saved and the human the robot may get destroyed, it will sacrifice itself. So these are the three laws of robotics and there are a whole set of stories written. Many of you, I don't know, how many of people, how many people have sort of read any of these stories? So this is an olden time, but wonderful stories. Right? So when I was growing up, we read all these stories and there were dilemmas. What happens? And one of the dilemmas, for example, is that a company is building a robot which is very expensive. So say this robot should not be destroyed so easily. So what do they do? They raise the potential of L3 inside the robot. Robot 
this robot will try to save itself why because its potential has been raised and now such a robot uh, even though L2 has higher priority but L3 has now become almost equal to L2 so in some situations it will not obey why because the robot can be harmed right a machine can be harmed so machine says sorry I am not going to obey your orders right these laws were formulated in science fiction and, and today incidentally the science fiction is becoming a reality not, not such a long ago and if you look at uh, mythology stories uh, from Indian mythology they have already imagined certain kinds of robots, Rakshasas which did not have uh, Atma or soul and they are the ones who are now like machines and then what dilemmas arise those are there okay. now there are many kinds of dilemmas one kind of dilemma is is causing pain to someone equal to causing harm to the person right now you give a tough exam to a class and students are pained they are you know very worried they are not doing well now is that causing harm to the person probably not they learn that they must become strong they must learn things well so what apparently appears to give pain is not necessarily harmful and of course there are stories in which this dilemma is played out what is harm and what is pain a person is swimming in water should he be forcefully removed from by the robot why because he might drown now you are taking over the freedom of action why because there is possibility of a harm person walking on the road so these three laws which may appear to be simple they are extremely hard and when we come to human society it things are much more nuanced things are much more complex and actually if you think of human values you know the, the conflicts that sometimes arise between values and our actions and external force that comes they are, they are much more uh, nuanced and complex situations then there are of course issues of mental harm putting pressure on somebody not physical harm but mental harm or mental pain pain is always mental actually uh, comfort versus harm telling false stories to please somebody right? there, there are all kinds of uh, dilemmas here okay? and I, I mentioned this last one this was uh, one of the stories now let us come to human being do you think these laws apply to human beings and somebody would say no no reverse L1 and L3 what does it mean saving yourself is the highest priority what is for robot L3 save yourself is lower than saving someone else L1 and L3 so somebody might say for human beings it is the L3 which has the highest priority and interchange L1 and L3 or whatever L3 becomes the most important thing but is that true is that true that L3 has the highest priority compared to L1 I would have preferred of course an interactive session we know from real life that there are counter examples 
and most common example of that would be mother and child or someone we love. In such a situation, L1 remains more than L3. Mother can sacrifice herself for the sake of the child. So, in one way, what were written as the laws of robotics, they are the ideal for human beings. Except we seem to have forgotten this. And forget about life, uh, forget about uh, extreme situation of life. Something very simple of helping somebody versus helping myself. There is no question of any death or anything. Those are extreme situations. But do we follow L1 more than L3? Yeah, somebody raised a hand. If you can quickly, if it is a clarification, I will give it. So, so we will come to that, but it is uh, clear that for these laws are for all human beings, not just for creator. So, a robot will not harm any human being, not just the human being who created the robot. So, so we will we'll discuss it. And so what is, uh, there are stories full of so what. <laughs> okay. So, we will return to, to this question uh, in a minute about, uh, just shortly. I want to now bring, so there is a contrast between robots and human beings. Now, I want to bring a contrast to you about Jal and Chetan, between matter and consciousness. Right? So, you know, the people in mechanical engineering, physics, science in general, what do you think Newton theorized in his laws of motion that was counterintuitive? That went against intuition. Not just against intuition, it was against every single experience of every single human being on earth. What was it in his theory that went against the human being? Uh, experience, human experience. Anybody? Hindi mein bol de. Unke paas, unke paas jazba tha ki wo logon ki khilaaf ja sakte the. Newton. Yeah. They didn't care about the world. They decided that they want to prove something and they worked on that. That was the main reason that uh, they opposed every intuitions and that is why they could theorize, theorize the laws of motion. But what was it in his theory that went against, that was not intuitive, it, uh, it was in fact against intuition, against experience. If you, yeah. Yeah, that uh, was not, was that counterintuitive? Uh, actions do seem to have a reaction. Uh, sir, this side. Yes. Actually, so uh, once he proposed that uh, the same force which the earth applies on apple, the apple applies on the earth. So it was against the institution uh, which we think originally. But uh, the thing was correct, that it was same amount of force, but uh, due to the variation of mass. It but is this is not uh, against experience. This is what theory is saying. But in my experience, I it is not against the experience. If I say somebody is saying it, well, yeah, maybe it is true, maybe it is not true. There was something that was against experience. Sir, uh, in the first law, he said that uh, an object will remain uh, in uh, as it is in rest, it will remain in rest, uh, but that uh, uh, friction was not uh, uh, very was close. counted as a very close to the answer. Yeah. Anybody? 
last one last thing then we'll i'll tell you the answer okay there is friction then motion is stopped there is no friction the motion will not stop it will continue to in the form of yeah but this is experience yeah what was against experience so very close so i i'll reveal the answer in the interest of time he said it's the innate property of matter to maintain the state of motion or rest energy of motion energy of rest is the conservation of momentum right what does it mean for moving objects a moving object will move forever right but you say no no how can that be innate property every moving object stops every single human experience tells us wherever we have thrown a ball we have thrown an object we have slid an object things stop you are saying the innate property is the opposite of it so this is counter intuitive and i wonder if you apply machine learning to such an experience it will come up with not newton's laws it will comes up come up with wrong laws requires a leap of imagination which newton applied and he said that moving object stop because there is a external force in this case friction but if there was no friction the moving object will move forever so the innate nature of matter is to maintain the inertia of motion and inertia of rest right everybody agrees now i'll come to innate property of consciousness right so in the case of matter this is the innate property of matter right gravitation is the the other side but i focused on the laws of motion so this is the innate property of matter now if we ask the question what is the innate property of human consciousness is l1 more than l3 or l3 more than l1 okay because every single experience shows that or almost right what if i say the opposite just as the laws of motion gave us a theory which is actually shows that our experience there is something called friction which is causing the change similarly question when we ask what do human beings want to do good to others or to cause harm to others to take care of others or not to take care of others but instead take care of themselves right the first this is related to law of l1 then we can relate l1 and l3 so the question is does a hungry hungry person feel happier in giving up his bread for others so you are hungry as i told you uh, we should take ordinary examples from life these life and death examples are too extreme but we can take them up later so you are very hungry you are about to eat and then would you feel happier in eating it or giving your roti to somebody else so this is the question yeah okay thank you uh we would feel better if we give it to someone else because if we eat it ourselves then there would be guilt involved and no one wants to feel guilty no but you are hungry very hungry yeah but that uh, that possibility like that situation eliminates itself when there is someone else who is in need of food so it is a need a property of humans to put our others need above ours so professor god would have said please go and do this experiment <laughs> is a human values course don't believe because it is being said or somebody in the audience is telling you this go and do this experiment yourself okay what happens 
so we do this uh, in within our family a lot of times like our mothers would do it for us and she is hungry and she has uh, and we are hungry too so she would sacrifice her food for us or we would do it for our brothers and sisters so it happens in families yes. and so, even in friends so another way is to ask your father or mother how did you feel did you feel happier or less happy the other thing is to do it yourself on yourself okay so the, the so when we give to a person we care for somebody provide help give food whatever to somebody who is related to us then we feel happy you try it don't don't take my word for it and in another another situation you don't give you eat it yourself and then see what happens to yourself okay so when you do this experiment you can do it thought experiment but you can do your real experiment in this so the innate nature of consciousness law of consciousness human consciousness just like we saw law of matter this is a law of human consciousness human beings feel happy when they do good to others even though their stomach may be paining because of hunger so so you know, on one hand one not happy because your stomach you are hungry on the other hand you see feel a sense of happiness okay and i leave it to you to judge so when you have consciousness which is built into us remember matter is the innate property of matter this is what newton discovered what is the innate property of human consciousness the innate property of human consciousness is we feel happy when we do something good to others okay but why do things not happen in real life most of the time just like in the case of matter moving objects don't move forever they in fact stop similarly in real life most of the time people don't help others they help themselves why the answer is the same friction this is a virtual friction in the mind and this friction is either fear or temptation human being so this how do we explain this so there are two evolutions that are taking place and human being is also evolving evolving with recognition of relationships what are these relationships when one goes from self to others who are these others family members members of the community and when it expands to cover the whole earth that is relationships at the level of world so there are two evolutions one is the we are familiar with the darwinian evolution this is in in fact the evolution of our body and as the evolution takes place from you know insects to invertebrates to vertebrates of course from plant kingdom also comes in then animals and finally we say the human being has evolved evolved with the brain okay so that is the physical evolution similarly there is a mental evolution right if there is a better word than mental it is the evolution of our self the self evolves what is this evolution we see the relationship with every human being we first see the relationship in our family right when we are born natural to us then we see in larger family something else comes in and 
makes us confused. But otherwise, if it were to evolve properly, then we would see in the larger family, community, our village, our city, our country and the whole world. So this second evolution is where the human humankind is stuck. And why is it stuck? That's what I would like to tell you briefly. Now, we decided to construct a society based on two axioms. These can be called as the civilizational axioms. It says human being is selfish and human being is greedy. Okay, they are related. Now, given that we have bad atoms, how can we do some produce good molecules, good society? This human beings are bad. How do we build a society that is good? So, we should harness this negative forces for societal benefit. And for this, how to do it very efficiently? It is done through markets and competition. Markets is the mechanism for efficiency and competition creates fear so you will do your utmost to save yourself, save your company, save your livelihood and so on. So you build a society which is full of conflict. Okay. And the current wave of globalization has spread this idea to the whole world. Okay. There is only one problem. It goes against the innate nature of human being. Suppose Newton has given these laws. You are building a machine and you want to put a motor. Right? You build a pump or an automobile. You put a motor. And it's not, uh, you know, the work is not getting done properly. You say, no, no, more power is needed. I'll put bigger motor. You have two options. You can either put a bigger motor or you can lubricate. Okay? You can lubricate the machine the same motor will not turn the, will do the work. So when we build a society and we are finding that greater and greater force is needed to keep people in line. Why? Because they don't want to turn. This, this motor doesn't want to turn. This pump doesn't want to turn. Doesn't want to, you know, the pistons don't move. So, you put a bigger motor. No, no, no. Lubricate it. So, if you want to build a society and there is friction, not yet over, friction is not yet gone, there is some friction. Would you build bigger and bigger jails or you will build more beautiful educational institutions? That is the challenge. Would you put in, in education, would you bring in the elements of value education? Would you bring in meditation? Calm people down first. They are churning. What do you do? Lectures don't make a difference. And in when they become calm, they will hopefully connect with their thoughts, with their inner self. At the level of understanding, talk about value education. So they understand and then provide a platform for experience, for practice. So if you want to provide professor of practice in this, you see the whole world is working on an axiom which is false. 
So the crisis which is there, not just crisis in our country, it's a crisis across the world. But I believe in science. So I don't say you should have values, you should practice values. You will practice values. You will have to practice values if you want to be happy. You will feel happy if you do it. Question is, we have begun to assume that no, this can't be done. Let me save myself and kill others. Let others die, if not kill others. So a different environment will provide us with a right societal structures will provide us with something that will make, that will be aligned with our innate nature. So today there is lack of human relationships, leads to individualism, consumerism, but you still don't get happiness ultimately leading to purposelessness, depression, and I'm afraid, suicide. There's no purpose in living. No purpose left in living. So, the human being is doomed to be unhappy with the current civilizational axioms. Why? Because they go against the innate human nature. So when we talk of AI, I started with AI but I came to human being. There are fundamental questions about what is consciousness? Can robots, can AI be conscious? We can discuss those issues over discussion now, and but first on the thesis that I have tried to present is that the education, task of educational institutions and teachers is to nurture our students with the larger vision about human nature, allow them to discover it within themselves and then they will be able to change the world. Thank you. We have two questions. Lot of questions. Lot of questions. Yeah. So the people with the microphone, so just raise your hand and yeah. your permission and just sit down. And just sit down. Yes. Yeah. So, one microphone here. I have it. I have it. I have it. Okay. <laughs> so, sir, you talked about the law 1 and law 3. So, you said that if AI can get consciousness and if AI do get consciousness and if it can figure out the way to deal with emotions and other stuff that humans do, is it possible that a robot... Can we postpone this question? We'll take it later. I'll take this issue of consciousness. But first, what I've talked about already. It is talked. Uh, yeah. Is related but to let's that, take but. that first. Then I will. I'll take up this question. Yes. Any experience in? Yeah. My name is Bupinder Godara, and uh, I don't know whether you have any experience. Um, Having students discover their innate human nature. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, can you share like a short glimpse of? Uh, Lots of examples I have. Otherwise, I will not stop. I'll keep <laughs> saying. But so in this uh, human values course, we tell the students to do experiments. So they say, you know, these auto drivers cheat me. Mm -hmm. That try. That instead of. Uh, 100 rupees, he asked for 120. He said, next time, it will only cost you 20 rupees extra, do an experiment. Give him 150 and then see what he says. You know, he returns. He said, nahi sahab, 100 rupees ka hai. 
120 नहीं चाहिए थैंक यू विद द शॉप वेयर दे गो विद द फ्रेंड हुम दे हैव फॉट ओके वो आर नॉट स्पीकिंग नाउ फॉर ईयर यू ट्राई दिस इन द एक्सपीरियंस एंड इट कम्स आउट so uh, i have uh, two small questions one may not be appropriate but i will ask uh, <laughs> because you know uh, you started uh, some good programs at different institutions okay where you have worked or like we always do but once the leadership comes suddenly what happens to them they suddenly just stop those programs so where actually in human value as a leader we are failing to continue the good things so we can continuously growing rather than having the periodic cycles of excelling and then again de excelling and excelling and de excelling so how you can add it i think uh, thermodynamics is very clear <laughs> kinetics is what needs to be worked out yeah so why is kinetics that way ups and downs so my changes let me when changes take place uh people are have grown up with this false idea that everybody is selfish so they think if i don't do it it will not work so the leadership also thinks that way leadership has not come from heaven they are also grown up in this sad atmosphere sad or whatever but thermodynamics is very clear it's going to happen whether you like it or not there is only one caveat which has come now and my, whether we will destroy the earth first <laughs> and my second small question is uh, like uh, i personally experience i and i hope everyone may be experiencing the egoness within ourselves so where you put that egoness in context to the consciousness like inherent properties of human being or its part of frictions so i would say it is not a innate property it is the failure to understand our own self so so this you see the physical evolution took place in this atmosphere of as the as darwin would say uh, competition and survival of the fittest right although the people say that no no it's not right to say survival of the fittest survival of the species not just individual but anyway so the physical evolution is taking place in that environment it took place so we assume that this is what this is how things are and we ourselves don't like it but we end up doing it. so what happens everybody is unhappy number of people who have become unhappy with all the better conditions of technology better material resources the number of people who have become unhappy depressed they have grown it's not a small number those societies which have achieved a much higher level of material goods but based on this theory of globalization or based on the theory of uh, selfishness and greediness the number of people who are depressed are very very large 30% population is depressed how can that be you have done something seriously wrong sorry uh, hello sir मेरे फादर इन लोग जो बीमार थे तो चाचा जी यानी कि वो मेरे फादर इन लोग के छोटे भाई थे जब भी वो घर आते थे उनका टॉयलेट को खुद ही साफ करते थे सब कुछ वो ही करते थे और हमेशा जैसे हम कुछ भी बोलते थे तो बोलते थे नहीं भाई साहब का सारा काम मैं खुद ही करूँगा मुझे इन सब को करने में बहुत अच्छा लगता है क्योंकि मेरे भाई भाभी ने मुझे जो है अपने बच्चे की तरह पाला है जो इतनी सारी जो हम बातें उनके लिए कर रहे हैं हैप्पीनेस की और वैल्यू एजुकेशन की जो इतना जब उन्होंने सब कुछ करा है चाचा जी ने 
तो वो वैल्यू एजुकेशन उन्हें घर पे भी वो सब कुछ ये दिखाते थे अपने कर्मों के द्वारा और हमें भी हर चीज़ का हर चीज़ का जो उनके पास सोल्यूशन था हम कुछ भी बोलते थे कि ये हमारी प्रॉब्लम है या हमें ये अच्छा लग रहा है एक सेकंड में वो उसको सॉल्व कर देते और उनका जो सबसे अच्छा जो बात मुझे लगती थी हमेशा ये बोलते थे कुछ भी खा ले कुछ भी खा ले कुछ भी पी ले लेकिन बेटा तू सुख से जी ले हर चीज़ में वो सुख ढूंढते थे खुशी ढूंढते थे तो बहुत अच्छा लगा मुझे आज यहाँ आकर उनके बारे में ये मतलब ये सब सुनकर क्योंकि जो भी सारी बातें वो बिल्कुल हंड्रेड बिल्कुल ठीक है हेलो सर विद द करेंट सिविलाइजेशनल एक्सियम्स हम देख रहे हैं कि वी आर वेरी मच सराउंडेड बाय डिजिटल टेक्नोलॉजीज एंड ऑल सो माय क्वेश्चन इज वेदर वी कैन से दैट इट्स देर इज अ ट्रेंड ऑफ ह्यूमनाइजेशन ऑफ मशीन्स और मैकेनाइजेशन मैकेनाइजेशन ऑफ ह्यूमन बींग्स विच फ्रेज और विच स्टेटमेंट विल बी करेक्ट yeah we are uh, mechanization of human beings is happening much faster <laughs> so yeah that's the unfortunate uh, situation uh, we could uh, by the way what i have mentioned here is this is based on a philosophy called madhyas darshan jeevan vidya also it is called and it says that when we talk of matter jad vastu we don't say uh, apple should fall down stone should fall down we don't say say apple will fall down similarly for human being we should say we should we, sh we we should i mean there's no point saying speak the truth you will speak the truth why as you realize yourself you will speak the truth as you realize yourself you will help others so this is as strong a law as the laws that we are accustomed with regarding science once we recognize the innate nature of human being so i have given a very small glimpse but there is a very uh, you know well worked out whole set of things that are going on inside us so ego question of ego came there are many other questions which will come we, 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 you know and uh, those can be you know discussed in in an uh, it will require a little more time and in the human values courses this was the idea that was you are trying to give where you, it was said don't believe what we are saying you try it yourself in your own life regarding relationships regarding anger regarding trust regarding respect regarding affection regarding how you view uh other people in society just right so this is where if you ask me the western society gave lot of stress to order organization and order in society asian societies build themselves on human relationships okay now whatever is the accidents or situations of history we have reached a point where the asian societies are now undermining relationship our relationships are going away families is still there we still have hope the western societies have destroyed their family but it will also come back but it's very hard much harder for them to bring it back the order that we are trying to create cold order no order organization we want we want things to be organized not chaotic but with relationship and relationship is a feeling that is what values are i so value it's a feeling inside me that i feel and when i start understanding it then i become a different human being okay different means evolved human being i'm still a human being you are a human being we are all the same we all have the same capacities but it's a process of evolution how we are evolving ourselves so first of all thanks for the amazing talk i especially like the allegory of friction the way you brought that into this sir uh, just one thing regarding this last slide where you've written human beings are uh, doomed to be unhappy so there are some uh, tantric philosophers who believe that as you said the competition and fear and 
material, if, if I can call that materialism as such, is actually one road to the pathway towards realizing that there is something more than just the material nature of the world. So, so do you really think that the world is doomed or uh, because there are material comforts, people are now finally realizing that, oh, there's something more to this world than just the material comforts. And in my experience, I feel that there are more young people and business leaders and so many other people turning to things like meditation and spirituality, which was probably absent about 100, 200. So, so like you said, do you think this is the next phase of Darwinian evolution where we are now moving away from material positions to realizing that there is something more to this consciousness? Yeah, no, no, I, I, I am an optimist. So, when I say doomed, it is in the sense of raising the warning. And I feel confident that these civilizational axioms will be thrown away. How much time will it take? Maybe as short as 20 years or 50 years. And once these civilizational axioms are thrown away, the real axioms or those things which are aligned with human nature, innateness of human being, they will come in. And then we will build a different society. We will build, build a society in which we help each other, in which communities live peacefully with each other. Members of community help each other. So that is what the society will come. And I think it will come sooner than we think. But I told you the only problem is that clock is ticking away, climate change, environment, destruction of earth is ticking away. So, so, so that is the race. And the moment we figure this out, we will solve the environment problem also. Yes, um, thank you sir for this whole talk that we had, it was quite, um, I would say enlightening for me and in a way I'm from, I belong to a very typical humanities background. So looking at this issue from a technical aspect also gave me some new ideas to it, although the thermodynamics and kinetics just went up from my brain, but yeah, uh, I have a few questions here not just two questions, um, where uh, the, the, what I believe is that when we are, t when we are thinking about the consequences and we are um, moving towards, uh, you know, quick, curing the consequences, it would be a temporary solution. I would like to focus on the cause. Now, my question is that when we talk about the Asian societies and you said that the Asian societies already had this in their, in, in, in the societal consciousness that we have to focus upon human relationships and everything. What is the cause that has led us to move away from them, um, fr from the West towards the East? That's my question. Huh? If I was so, clear uh, It's a good question and you should, uh, you know, yourself take it up as research. But what I would say and give indicators as my, based on my understanding, you see, there are these two levels. Uh, in Madhyas Darshan, it is called Priya Hit Lab. Priya means what is taste, Hit means body, Lab means profit, economy if you like, right. Now this level, uh, is for the body actually. So, an animal will use the taste to decide whether to eat it because it is good for its body or not. Okay, And we can do the same. Hit is for the health and economy would be how efficiently, how effectively we make use of resources. Now, this is necessary for the body. If you don't eat, what will happen? If you eat wrong things, what will happen? We will die. So, this level is for, is a necessary condition for maintaining and keeping the body in good health and for our resources in good, you know, good use. This higher level is Nyaya Dharma Satya. Justice, Dharma, there is no English translation for it and Satya is truth. Uh, which has a higher meaning. Okay. So, Nyaya Dharma Satya. Now, this second level is what 
वी आर मेंट फॉर ओके प्रिय हित लाभ इज नेसेसरी फॉर अवर एग्जिस्टेंस न्याय धर्म सत्य इज द पर्पज ऑफ अवर लाइफ विच विल ब्रिंग अस हैप्पीनेस वेन वी से वी डिड समथिंग इट मेड अस हैप्पी इट इज केयरिंग फॉर द अदर्स मेड अस हैप्पी न्याय इज दैट जस्टिस वी डिड समथिंग गुड सो दिस इज बिल्ट इन ओके सो दिस सेकेंड लेवल इज अ हायर फॉर्म एंड इफ सम इफ यू रिमेन लिमिटेड टू प्रिय हित लाभ we will for animal it is sufficient animal will eat and then sleep no problem unfortunately we are not like that after our stomach is full then we say what do we do now and we will be unhappy if you don't do anything okay uh, my second question to you is that like you talked about uh, innate um, energies that we have the, the innate feelings humans have to help others but also when we talk about ego when ego as in the sense of self and survival instincts these are also something that is innate to the human so these could bring clashes between the two how would we resolve that so it's the same if i can say so uh there is this question about community so i actually wrote a book uh about my experience at i to be at you i think because there are many young people sitting here there are two indias one india is the aspirational india we want to achieve this we want to do that the other is the relational india it lives on relationships right now which one do you want relational both okay <laughs> why not aspiration also we want aspiration as well as relationship agreed but there is a problem today these two indias are in conflict why aspirational india is current society translates it into very narrow terms and human being also translates it into very narrow things aspiration means my fame my money my power so i know we are born with grand aspirations and we have reduced it to such a narrow thing so this is the problem of aspirational india currently need not be so what is the problem with relational india we are together we see you will kill you group conflicts hate to others what do you do inherently neither of these two are meant to be negative aspiration if your aspiration is larger your vision is larger your aspiration is the whole world not just your own money and your own car or own house this is up to you you evaluate it or talk to people who have made money and are now 50 or 60 think we have wasted our life didn't do anything right because our aspirations are much bigger so we need to expand our aspirations and we need to understand that our community can live very well with another community with others right so individual to society there is no conflict there need not be conflict if you have a wrong understanding we get into a conflict That's a great food for thought. Thank you so much. Sir, uh, as we all know that uh, whoever holds the power reigns the world. Or I would say that I have seen this in my life. So. as power in, uh, increases for a person their greed also increases for a person and uh, vice versa uh, their ego inflates and so, other things so do you think that these uh, quote that human being is doomed to be unhappy with the current civilized axiom we if we can't uh, pro- solve the problem at that bigger level so power makes people happy right that was your starting statement 
power makes so, people greedy no they feel good i thought that's what you said uh being power being powerful doesn't mean happy like okay. i have seen people with more money but they don't feel much happy okay. because they don't have then what are you saying sorry people i am saying that being uh, having more power makes people greedy okay after that so i i want to ask do you think that if we if if they can't uh, at that level people don't understand these basic human innate nature they and don't the understand yeah they don't understand so then you how you know what, alexander yeah. when he was dying as you know he knew that he is dying now young person but dying you know what he said can you cover my body with this white sheet kafan leave my hands outside they said why let the world see i am not carrying anything with me entire life's goal to conquer the world he saying i got nothing out of it i am dying with empty hands right? now the question is not alexander question is civilization so there is a civilization that calls alexander the great because he wants to be world conqueror and succeeded in some ways he didn't conquer india but he did conquer many countries another civilization calls ashoka the great because he gives up war this tells you civilizational values and if you ask me civilizational blunders okay so then what about current civilization uh, blunders? blunders civilizational blunder like but it is an improvement we are no longer talking of war to conquer we are saying competition globalization we won't kill people but we'll make them buy our products okay so lesser of the evil so to me that's an advancement Can I ask you about the AI consciousness question? I was just waiting. I was going to come to that, but one other last question was there. Then I can come. To um, hello, hello, sir. I really enjoyed the talk, and uh, I just wanted to bring your attention to the trolley problem. Actually, I was <laughs> studying that something that Philippa Foot talks about. Which problem? Sorry. So the trolley problem. but something that philippa ford talks about uh, i just wanted to ask you if we talk about the switch version and uh, do i have to like should i just say the problem so that everyone understands so let's take the driverless car then i'll come to your other question okay driverless car sir so i'm i'm talking about the switch uh, switch version of the problems of course there are many versions yeah, there put you will kill either the right Person who is uh, yeah, or the laborers who are working on the track. Right? Yes, sir. So I am asking you that uh, there is a version in which uh, the person who is opposed the dilemma, he he is opposed with the problem that uh, on one side there is a family member and then the other five strangers who he does not know. So people usually choose the family member and not the five strangers, uh, despite the fact that however young or however responsibility are on upon the five workers, it doesn't really matter. So. uh this although it is very theoretical but uh, this result that people give from the interviews or surveys that are being done doesn't that uh, present to us a possibility that people might be selfish because that, that is indeed a selfish decision to save a family member and not five strangers so i'll give you a real example It's from my uh, my experience okay. and i'll re relate it with driverless car because when you put ai in the car there is this dilemma will you kill the pedestrian or you will kill the passenger okay so i was i was uh, riding in the car and this was a taxi driven by taxi driver whom i know very well and i was sitting we are going at uh, is going at maybe it was not over 100 it was maybe 90 kilometers per hour and as the taxi is going on this highway suddenly there is a motorcyclist 
who is driving it and there is a lady sitting behind who wears and comes in front of the car but its speed is very low 50 and this car is hurtling at 90 and I am sitting besides the driver and I said my god nothing can be done and he is 50 feet away or I, I can't guess 100 feet away and I can see that the car is going at the speed and is going to be crushed. But this is a very good driver, this is my friend. And he was a driver of uh, tankers, petrol tankers. Okay? But he is driving this car which he has. He applies brakes, very hard brakes. And then I see there is a highway on which there is a, you know, 3, 4 feet high divider, can't do anything. But there is a break, about 100 feet away, there is a break in the divider. So I see that he has applied the break and he is taking the car towards that. If he cross that, because there is a gap in the divider, if he crosses that gap, there are cars coming in the opposite direction. We will be dead. Okay, and then fortunately the car comes to a stop just before this and this person who was driving this motorcycle and probably his wife, uh, they are probably villagers, village clothes and he is telling his wife, Tere se poocha to tha ki piche ko gaadi to nahi hai. He had asked his wife, is there a car behind? He did not turn this much, he just asked. And she said, <laughs> Then they get down, they come, touch the feet of the driver. I said, Aap kaise bach gaya? I have no idea today. Few seconds later, there is another motorcycle which comes. He says, I was coming from the opposite direction. So after a minute or two. And I saw this happening, I have come to see how did he survive. So I asked my driver friend, you knew that there is this gap after they are you know, gone and if you had gone in the other side, there will be a serious accident. More than one vehicle will be involved, how many people will die. What could, what would you have done? if the car had not come to a stop. You know what he tells me? After this gap in the divider, there is this curb. The divider does not start right away. There is this smaller curb which is built, divider which is again like a divider but a smaller curb. So I would have put the car on the curb. This is the car he owns now which he has bought as a proud now owner of his own vehicle. I would have put the car on the curb. I said, but that car could have overturned at that speed. So, uh, what does he say? What would the AI driver done? Probably crush the crush, woman. Crush the and save the passenger. And what would be the ad in the TV? Very okay. safe car for Very the passenger. Safe. It will not let you die <laughs> or it will save you. But what they will not say is it will kill others. Alright, thank you sir. <laughs> so briefly now. Okay, so, what uh, is consciousness? Sir, uh, before okay. that I have one question, small question. That if AI figures out some way how to deal with consciousness or emotions, what if uh, AI harm human beings for the betterment of human beings? So, what do you mean by that? Any, thing, like, any thought you have in mind? Like uh, This is like the dilemma. Will you kill five persons or one person? 
yeah it, let's take an example like if we are in current world and there's this huge bad going on with human beings like they're destroying themselves and uh, we already know that eventually at one point we will be doomed so what if ai sees this and they already know that eventually that will going to that will be happen and uh, if they decide so, to so let i understand in fact that was the question about the trolley you know so what what does it mean to be conscious i'll just say very briefly we can discuss it after this question is can machines understand can machines be conscious they can so the, one minute just listen first question to ask is can machines feel pain now on this question there is an agreement among philosophers machine can't feel pain so suppose there is a robot you know it its arm gets heated is burnt okay and tears come out of its eyes designed very well do you think the robot felt pain there was a there was a switch here valve here which released uh, water drops so like it came out as tears it may even have cried mar gaya mar gaya did it feel pain so there is agreement no it didn't feel pain there was a program running whether learned by machine as machine learning or through programmed variable went to such and such value at that value these valves got released and the tears came out right so robots can't feel pain there is sort of agreement on this the second question is can robots or machines understand okay so there was this uh, well known turing test which was proposed in the 50s long before ai the turing test was that there are two rooms doors are locked in one room there is a human being in the other room there is a robot and you as a interrogator you can ask questions and you will get back an answer so you put but you should not be able to see otherwise you will recognize this is a robot this is a human being so you can't see you can't but you can put a chit put a question and in the room the answer both same question you can put to both answers come based on that you decide who is a human being and who is the robot if you are not able to decide this no matter what you you are free to ask whatever you want that means robot has become equal to human being why because you can ask anything you want and you get back an answer but you can't distinguish any more so this was this is known as the turing test right captcha is a simple form of a turing test now so we believe that you know turing test is the ultimate ai means it has to pass the turing test there is another test which came based on you know as a thought experiment this is no known, known as the chinese room test or chinese room experiment so there is a room in which there is a person this person doesn't know any chinese it knows only hindi and you go and ask a question in hindi you put a slip below through the door like before but there is only one room now not two rooms just one room and you get back an answer you ask something more you get back another answer and you say answers are perfect now this person doesn't know any hindi he knows only chinese but the answers are coming out to be perfect what is he doing 
he has a book of grammar it has a book of syntax dictionary it doesn't can't even read alphabet but it has a book of alphabet which are patterns so when you pass a slip it looks at the pattern it looks up the book then it figures out looks up the dictionary then looks up the grammar rules then it does some more operations and then finally it scribbles in chinese and the answer comes it scribbles something it doesn't know any chinese uh, i'm sorry any hindi sorry person knows chinese so now perfect answers are given so the question then to ask is so you would say that machines can understand machine whatever is inside this room it has passed the turing test but when you open the door there is a human being he can't speak hindi and is answering all your questions in hindi so the question is where is the understanding if you ask that person he said i don't know anything about what you asked i just applied my rules i did programming as per my program i did all this yes perfect answer was produced but i have no idea of what you asked i have no idea what answer you gave you agree with this then you ask oh is the understanding in the notes he made he might have made some notes some temporary memory cache memory or memory in the computer like it's like a machine now no he's made some notes but those notes are about patterns is no idea about your question so you can display as if there is understanding but there is no understanding so anybody anything that practices this cannot feel pain and cannot understand in our terminology of in indian terminology this is an old question these are not new questions actually the experiment may look very new bhokta drashta and karta bhokta means what one who can bhog can experience the pain or the taste the pleasures so there is no bhokta machines can't be bhokta machines cannot understand they cannot be drashta understanding means i am able to see drashta means that right and if these two are missing machine cannot be karta there can be no karma okay there will be actions but there is no karm no intentional action there are no intentions why because there is no understanding so ai cannot have consciousness no matter what answers it gives it cannot be bhokta it cannot be drashta it cannot be karta thank you sir so I'd like to uh, now invite uh, professor sangeeta kohli to propose a vote of thanks so uh, it's my pleasant duty to present a vote of thanks first of all a very um, you know heartfelt gratitude and thanks to professor rajiv sangal for delivering such an insightful lecture and coming all the way from indore to deliver the lecture so many thanks to him next i would like to thank professor p l dhar and the other donors who actually initiated this lecture series and made this talk possible so we are also really grateful to the institute lecture series committee for uh, recognizing the second rrg memorial oration as an institute lecture so th- many thanks to the dean academics office So we are really grateful to Professor Ara, uh, Professor Ara Gaur's family, 
who are here in full strength and they have shared their thoughts with us we are really grateful to all of you thank you so much and we are also very grateful to all his friends who have come all the way to attend the talk so many thanks so finally we would like to thank all the organizers so i'm really personally grateful to mr gaurav sachdeva and other members of uh, the dean academics office who really helped in organizing and taking care of all the logistics so making all the arrangements possible and it was so smooth and so easy thanks to their efforts similarly nrc staff particularly mr surender ms niraj they are always tirelessly behind us whenever we are doing any event so many thanks to you seminar hall staff the recording staff and the, uh, all the other arrangements which have been made thank you so much to all of you and last but not the least many thanks to all the people who have been here and who are continuing to stay till the last and you know raising such interesting questions which made the whole interaction so joyful thanks a lot so so now i would like to invite all of all the faculty members and other friends and other guests to come to the first floor for uh, light refreshments the students can pick up their boxes of refreshments as they go out thank you so much